everyone, and uh, welcome to our session, um, the workshop 189 on open government data for citizens, by citizens, about citizens. Um, we, are, we have an excellent panel here with us today, and that I'll quickly introduce after introducing myself. My name is uh, Desire Milosevic. I'm with Affilius, and uh, we're one of the um, company that uh, runs top-level domain name uh, registries like .info and look forward um, to our workshop that we help uh, co-organize uh, with the Open Rights Group here um, on our panel and our other participants. So briefly, I will um, start by a quick introduction of who we have here today on our panel. Um, next to me is Javier Ruiz. Uh, uh, Javier Ruiz is an activist and campaigner working on open um, data and access. Um, to my uh, right side is the, um, I have an opportunity for, and a pleasure being sitting next to Al Kags, who is the founder of, um, a trustee of the Open Institute in Kenya. And he's also the chair of Kenya Open Data Initiative. Um, f uh, next to him is um, Andrea Beccali. Andrea Beccali is with the um, International Foundation of uh, Libraries in The Hague. Uh, he's a project manager and policy and advocacy at the International Federation of Libraries Association, or IFLA. Um, to the um, left of um, Javier, we uh, have a pleasure also of having on our panel here today and we thank him for stepping in at this minute, uh, Leonard, uh, Leonard Housing, and um, he is an advisor on anything digital. He works with open data and work for the Green Party as well. And uh, last but not least uh, uh, is um, Dominic Lazanski. Dominic uh, Lazanski is uh, from a UK think tank, um, it's a Taxpayers Alliance, and she also sits on Open Data User Group in the um, Cabinet Office in the UK. We have also received apologies from the data.gov.uk representative who unfortunately um, could not be with us here today, so uh, I'm just passing on apologies. So in order to... Um, start our panel and uh, which will be uh, addressing the issues of about data policies that are being developed with regards to open government uh, data um, we will try to answer many questions such as whether governments have the right to create value out of citizen data as well as how should this be governed and whether citizens should be expected to provide data in exchange for public services and uh, further on, we will also look at the impact of core reference data. And, uh, for example, should governments provide truly free geolocation services and mapping off for their open data initiatives, or uh, whether they should leave these um, uh, to private companies that will provide uh, free and uh, services paid with the citizen data. So there's quite a um, um, range of complex um, data um, policies that uh, we should look at today. And uh, we'll also look how these open data policies in many cases sit alongside repressive policies that allow for surveillance of citizens' internet use and whether these place limitations on the promise of open data. Uh, with that, I would um, like to ask our first panelist, Javier uh, uh, Ruiz, um, to perhaps um, um, give us an overview of some of emerging issues with open government data. Thanks, Desiree. Yeah, I, I would like to just make a very brief introduction to the topic and just to, you know, I won't take very long and I think that hopefully we'll have more time for questions and answers. So just to understand, um, in previous IDFs, I think the workshop on open data was actually called a public sector information workshop, and the, uh, it was, that was the, um, you know, the epigram under which these um, discussions were falling. And just to understand, I think that there, well, there is a public sector information reuse uh, framework in Europe, 
and in the U.S. you have uh, simply a lack of intellectual property restrictions in much uh, federal uh, information, which has led to a whole spread and development of industries and reuse. And basically in the past few years this has exploded and become like really potentially quite important. So, but what open data uh, takes things one step further by really going for a completely proactive um, release of data to where you put it online with as minimal restrictions as possible to promote mass reuse. So you, we are talking about things like technical formats that enable uh, replication, reuse of the data, and particularly license. And very importantly, um, particularly you are in Europe in terms of data um, framework, is about the not non-discrimination of purposes and trying to put as little restrictions. So it's not that the idea with open data is that you don't go to contract uh, to sign a contract with government and explain how you're going to use the data, this is what you're going to you know, do or not do and pay a royalty or maybe not, but you just get it and you're going to and get other people to do it again and again and again and again. No? It's a bit about going viral basically with data. So of course, open data in its own, you know, uh, for many people is important, but also it's, uh, it's seen as a building block for what is called open government, which is the idea that you can actually transform the fundamental relationship between citizens and the state through information and engagement. You know, and that, that should be open data is going to be right at the bottom of that. So just to understand, when we talk about open data, mostly we mean uh, public data, in, but just to be clear, it doesn't have to be just public sector data. And increasingly there is, um, of course, with social media, everyone knows about Twitter analytics and things like that. But there are lots and lots of other data sets that come from companies that are really important for citizens. And as most, again, you know, as the private sector has um, higher importance, both social and economic, we will need to start asking questions of what the lines of responsibility and the public interest lie, you know? whether it's just with the state or also not just in the provision of public services by private companies, but also in things like private mapping or other infrastructure, things like that. I mean, infrastructure and transport are probably two of the key areas where the role of public company uh, of private companies uh, will need to be questioned in the next few years. No? So, going back to public data, we have uh, just to give a very very top level taxonomy. We we could identify uh, several types of data each with uh, its own uh, issues around governance and po potential implications. So, for example, if you look at what we call core reference data, core reference data are things like maps, weather, registers, things that the, where there is only one version of the truth, more or less, and normally provided by the state. And that is quite important. I mean, it normally has quite high economic value, in other cases, I mean, the problem is in some countries it can be very, very valuable. In other countries, it may not exist at all. You know, you may have countries that don't have a national mapping service, so that is a, that is a big question to ask. And again, here, you know, we raised the question before, should the government really be providing this uh, mapping for free? I mean, if you want to map public toilets, which is one of the things that has been done in many countries for people with disabilities, you need a map. So it's all very good, you know, if you, but if you have to use Google Maps and give information saying that you are disabled or you need that, you know. There is, um, I mean, there are many issues raised there. Then just another type of data, uh, functional data. This is where a lot of the mm, direct impact can come from open data. Things like the micro statistics that the departments use, for example, levels of pollution, you know, from the environmental department. Uh, again, public toilets, you know. Somewhere there is a, sta um, a spreadsheet in a government department of where public toilets are located. All that type of... Um, really useful bits of information, you know, all that can go out and really be put to a very good use. And we think that this is really one of the key areas. I mean, obviously, the, that type of functional data from the state extends to things like the judiciary, even parliamentary proceedings, but all the data that the state needs to function itself by sharing it with citizens can be a lot more useful, you know, and that is one of the, that we think is one of the key areas of open data. Mm -hmm. Then, I mean, obviously, the, we don't think that there are huge um, privacy implications in that type of data. Of course, there will be at some point. But we think that here the main thing is about how do you govern and how do you make sure that actually this data gets out. That's, uh, then public services data. The, here we have two types of data. There are, on the one hand, you have performance data, which is what um, many politicians will talk about public services, which is, uh, for example, the mortality rates of a particular doctor or hospital department. 
should you be able to choose which doctor you use on the basis of their previous experience of patients that of course we believe that that provides a type of uh, accountability on the delivery of public services which acts at the managerial level and one thing that we think is important is to distinguish this type of accountability from the political accountability of the elected representatives so that is something that we have to remember and that is a big big issue in the terms of public service data because many I mean you know it's all very good to say that this doctor is responsible but who is responsible for creating the policy framework that put that doctor there so um, then the other question with public services, the other type of data is actually where one of the biggest uh, issues um, in terms of open data uh, come up, which is the personal data of public service users. In the UK, there are now plans to share uh, medical records, uh, welfare data of many types with private companies in order to improve uh, analytics on that data. And that data actually, I mean, it, it is private data from citizens that is processed by the state as a data controller, I'm talking European data speak at the, right now, really, does the government have the right to even anonymize that data, you know, to create value for the state, or is this, I mean, how do we govern this? I mean, there are not two actors, there are three, there are the citizens that are the data, there is the state that is holding it, and then there are other third-party actors, and at the moment there isn't a very good governance framework for how do you deal with this. And of course, as big data becomes more and more important and people develop new applications and data handling capabilities, all this uh, information becomes more valuable and more useful. But we really need to think how we are going to govern that. And of course, we don't want to stifle innovation, but at the same time, we don't want to start going down a path that we cannot reverse later on. So we really have to be careful about this type of data. Then something that is important to see as well is public cultural information. This is something that is increasingly relevant. The, all the texts in public libraries ultimately is data. And this data can be really useful, not just for Google to develop translation services, but you know, for everyone else in society. There are lots of issues around the, whether this is public domain or belongs to the state or to libraries, you know, but we think that you know, this is going to be a bigger and bigger issue. Then again, you know, we say the public accountability before you know, things like uh, government meetings, you know, that is, again, public data. And we also think that should become under the framework to provide transparency. And finally, um, you know, we think that, going back to the first question, private sector data should definitely be included in this framework. And part definitely with public sector uh, delivery, uh, sorry, with public service delivery by the private sector, you know, but also in, in, other, in other contexts. So just to, um, to summarize, I mean, there, are, there have been lots of discussions, well, not lots, but enough discussions around privacy on some of these data sets. But what I think what we need to look at is not just at privacy or even data protection, but uh, what is the governance framework that is going to really let us you know, advance where we you know, and deliver all the really good things that this open data can deliver, but at the same time protect the interest of citizens, you know, who ultimately are the owners of that public data, and even they are the owners that they are the ones that pay the taxes, basically, that pay even the data that is not theirs. So we really have to include them. So just to cap, the benefits that we want to achieve, or at least in this the UK, from is transparency and incre increase uh, improved governance, better public services and economic development. And we think that you can integrate all these aspects. You know, unfortunately, in many cases, governments tend to focus on one or the other. And when they focus on transparency, they forget economic development. When they focus on economics, they forget the you know, citizens' uh, private data ownership, but we think that we need to integrate those. And as we said before, we also need to be careful about the wider context, you know, for example, in the UK, to give an example, we have the, some of the best open data policies, but right now we also have a plan by the government for setting up deep packet inspection black boxes in every single internet service provider. So if you are asking people to move all their lives online and we say that we are going to have this data, are we also saying that we are going to monitor and surveil all that data used by citizens. So we really need um, an open data, open data policy framework that sits alongside a wider, you know, digital policy framework that is a bit, you know, consistent. So thank you very much. Just to say that some of these questions will be also relate to some workshops that we'll take later on around the open government partnership, which is, you know, where this thing really comes to the fore, no? the, the relation between transparency and development and repression. I mean, we are in Azerbaijan. It's a country from the Open Government Partnership, which has an open transparency program, and at the same time, it's got bloggers in prison. So we really need to see how this thing works. Thank you. Thank you, Javier, for that very useful uh, overview. And um, 
and also a set of issues um, that um, we need to grapple with in order to find good governance models. Um, if I may ask um, Al, perhaps, to um, tell us a little bit about the work that the government in Kenya and private sector and the Open Institute has done, because that seemed to be the uh, shiny example and the leading example from a developing countries how things should work and how things should be done. Um, thank you very much for having me. Um, I thought I'd, uh, I'd focus my conversation uh, on what the experience has been in Kenya, but the Open Institute, as um, an African organization that is working with governments in Africa and other developing countries to um, to promote um, the opening up of data by, by government and to promote also the participation of citizens. Um, we've had some very interesting experiences and I, I just thought I'd share some of them at um, at high level and then maybe at the end of it take uh, questions. The first point that I wanted to talk about was the uh, the question of motivation. In a in the Kenya experience, for example, um, and in a lot of other countries, um, I think many of you will, will know that while uh, governments say that they would like to be as transparent, transpa transparent as possible, um, it isn't a very popular thing. Accountability tends not to be a popular thing, especially with uh, leadership. So um, getting uh, countries to publish data um, sometimes can be jeopardized by the fact that uh, the leaders are afraid of uh, what what that might mean. In Kenya, um, we took the view that uh, instead of pushing the question of accountability and transparency, we would instead push the question of um, prosperity, um, that open data will yield job employment, will um, help young people who are developers to develop applications, will help young entrepreneurs to find solutions that will um, better um, their lives and that sort of thing, um, which in Kenya turned out to be a very popular um, argument for the leadership um, and which we are finding also among other governments uh, in the region um, to be a popular um, way into going about it. I sort of disagree with the view that um, when you focus on, you know, development, you you might um, not focus, or you might not address yourself to accountability. I think the whole question is, so long as you get open, accountability happens as a default, um, which is why we don't talk up accountability; we talk it down, um, because of the fact that it it ends up being an, an uh, default uh, byproduct. The view that we take is that when the citizen is empowered to um, analyze issues, when the citizen is empowered to access the data, um, from that perspective, then they will they will do stuff with it. So once you have gotten governments to agree um, to publish uh, the data in principle, then um, you realize that from the leadership you go to the technocrats, and the technocrats then start grappling with the hows and and so on and so forth. In Kenya, we take a fairly utilitarian approach, and I have become a champion of, of a utilitarian approach, where um, you deliver in bits. So you take what you can get now, and you start with that, and then you build on it as you, as you go. I have seen a number of open data initiatives that are in danger of being stillborn because of the fact that there's an attempt to try and get everything perfect, an attempt to try and ensure that the um, platforms that you use are open source and so on and so forth as we would like them, an attempt to ensure that the licensing regime is in place at the time that you're um, publishing, an attempt to ensure that you have uh, a certain number of important data sets in a certain kind of level of quality, an attempt to, you know, all of these things. So my my general suggestion uh, um, and in the experience that we've had in Kenya is that we went and looked for um, whatever was readily available. We found census data, household data, um, we found um, health data and education data, and we found that our Ministry of Education had already been trying to publish um, their data in, 
you know, uh, their own little site. We were able to incorporate that. Um, and we went ahead in a very short time, in a span of eight weeks from the day that we decided that uh, this was the time that we were going to focus on it. Within eight weeks, we had launched an open data portal, and then it, we continued sort of pushing um, more data onto it. Um, the reason that this is important is because when you do these things incrementally, you also show the technocrats who sometimes are also afraid of what open data means and what this openness means and who have grown up, uh, many of them have been working in the civil service for a long time, and who have come to believe that um, governments are supposed to hold data secret, so it's not supposed to be published. The, this is the environment with which they have grown up, that if a citizen wants data, then they should apply for it and we can take a judicial decision whether or not to give it to them. If you're going to allow um, for something like that, then what you have to do is to um, sh demonstrate that there's no threat um, to publishing the data and really, really hope that uh, once you publish the data that the media does not immediately grab on it and, and, and find a scandal, um, at least at the beginning, because of the fact that if they do, then the governments tend to sort of uh, go back. But if, uh, first of all, you get into the system and then after that there's a scandal, then there's no problem because it's already moving. The, the third aspect of it is once you have started publishing the data, then you have to really focus on um, building the ecosystem. Um, and this is what we do at the Open Institute. Um, and the ecosystem here we're talking about, first of all, the ecosystem of data producers being um, government, civil society, ensuring that civil society and private sector are publishing their data as well. Um, the media has access to a lot of data that they have accumulated over many years, so making sure that they um, begin to publish that data. Um, and the academia, who also have, um, over the years, sort of gathered data from different uh, sources, and you make sure that they also um, publish it. Important to mention here um, at the IGF that uh, there's been a lot of pressure by civil society to get government to publish uh, its data. There's also been a lot of uh, pressure by civil society and citizens to get pri private sector to publish the data. I think the one um, uh, s uh, sector that is yet to really get open um, is the civil society itself. And um, I think that the time that the civil society is going to get away, away with it is, is fast coming to an end. So I think the civil society has to begin to lead from the front in being as open as possible um, uh, where you know um, publishing data is concerned. The second uh, ecosystem is of intermediaries. A lot of the data, yes, you want the citizen to engage with it, but a lot of the data is not in a format that allows the citizen to engage in it because you're providing the data in its rawest possible format. The best way to um, get um, the citizen to um, have access and have an understanding of that data is by um, dealing with the intermediaries. And the intermediaries tend to be the civil society organization that work with the citizens, that build capacity, that... Um, work with community groups and so on. Um, the media um, that are going to tell interesting data stories um, out of it. And then the developers who build apps that enable the citizen to then interact with, um, with it. In Kenya um, and in a couple of other countries, the Open Institute has worked with the World Bank and the African Media Initiative and others to um, do things like um, a data boot camp for where we bring in um, three different sectors. We bring in um, the media, of course, journalists and editors, um, and then you bring in members of the civil society themselves, and then you bring in developers together, and you, and you try and make them into small teams that then not only learn how to um, you know, publish stuff out of data, f tell stories out of data, but also that gets them to actually develop stuff um, at the tail end of that training so that um, they get into the sink of uh, sort of building things. Um, and then the f final ecosystem is one of users. Once uh, there's applications, there's means for, for citizens to begin to analyze this data and to play with the data and to use the data, then you want to make sure that the citizen then begins to engage on the basis of data. 
one of the things that we saw recently um, by way of anecdote um, in Kenya is our police commissioner went to speak to the university um, and when he was there um, the students uh, took him to task about uh, the recruitments of uh, the poli of the pol uh, you know the recruitments into the police force and they were thinking you know people from this region are more than people from that region um, what is the case um, there's not enough um, college students who are getting into the police force why is it what's the package and that sort of thing so and he was uh, you know reasonably shocked to discover that because of the fact that people were um, had done their research before that meeting um, he now knows um, in future that he will not only go with platitudes which is what uh, government of officials tend to go with for meetings with the citizen but they will be a lot more prepared now and they'll be able to um, be a lot more accountable um, which is the byproduct we were talking about once you have done this, the innovation is ongoing, uh, the users are working, the media is telling the stories and that sort of thing. Um, the other aspect that you have to focus on, you're focusing on all of these things most likely simultaneously. Um, the other aspect to focus on is to build the legal frameworks that are benchmarked globally. But I champion that they must be, uh, that it is more important that they are focused on the local um, situation because the local situation tends to be unique. A lot of countries tend to look for best practice um, and forget to customize it to their own specific um, environment. Um, as a result, um, adoption of, of, um, of, the, of the, the data tends not to be very um, you know, high. Um, in Kenya, um, the legal framework looks like this. Uh, number one, we have the uh, constitution that guarantees the citizen rights, uh, uh, the citizens' right to information. Um, this, uh, you know, explicitly. Number two, um, we have a cabinet paper that we did at the time of the launch that tells um, the public sector how to publish data and that they need to look for the data to publish it on a regular basis. Um, this is a provisional document um, that essentially um, sanctions uh, the publishing of data and that enables, because uh, public sector tends not to be able to do stuff unless there's a piece of paper that is uh, showing them, and there's a certain policy that is showing them how they're going to um, do this. So this cabinet paper has served that purpose. As we work on a freedom of information bill, and one of the, the most popular aspects of the Freedom of Information Bill, um, in my view, um, that is currently um, under review for Parliament, um, is that it proposes government proactivity um, in publishing data. Now, I have seen a lot of in, um, Freedom of Information Bills, and a lot of them say are a little vague about this subject. I am... Uh, particularly advocating that whenever we're working on freedom of information bills of this nature that and especially where they talk about open data that they talk about two things that number one that the government will proactively publish the data which means that the citizen there's no loophole for the citizen to need to apply or to need to write a letter or to need to ask for something so first the proactivity question and then the 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 second bit is to try and um, say that the government has to publish it with the prevailing within the prevailing technology that is available. So, uh, as we heard from uh, yesterday, um, the internet is likely to be replaced by something else, or um, some of these platforms are going to change, and so on. <coughs> <coughs> I apologize; I have a cold. Um, but. Um, we have to ensure that the the citizen the, the data is published in using prevailing technologies meaning that if the country has a data portal then the government does not just publish it um, using paper but they also make sure they publish excel sheets onto the data portal and that sort of thing um, then we have the data protection bill that uh, of course deals with the privacy issues um, and then um, the final thing is that all the data is um, uh, um, is provided um, under a Creative Commons license, 
um, which is free for use and reuse, but uh, with a requirement, with a proviso that you must acknowledge source, um, which in my view is important because of the, then you provide credence to that data as well. Um, thank you very much. Thank you, Al. I'm sure you get a lot of uh, questions. Thank you for that uh, rich outlay of how things worked and all your advice and uh, suggestions. Um, before, um, it would be now probably useful to hear from Andrea how citizens um, can access this open government data and to give us some examples of that. Thank you, Desiree. <coughs> and, uh, well, actually, I was really interested to listen to the last presentation. You mentioned a couple of words that sparkled some ideas in my mind. You spoke about ecosystems. So, so far, we have been looking at government providing data. And then, uh, and in an ecosystem, you see there are def different actors. And then you spoke about these infomediaries. So, how you actually get citizens know which data are out there. <coughs> and, um, and among the infomediaries, you mentioned the media, which have ex an extremely important role. But I was waiting for. Uh, another actor that I think can play a really important role in the ecosystem on the demand side, and that's libraries. Um, just to give you an idea, uh, from a recent survey that uh, IFLA made, uh, there are around 320,000 libraries worldwide. And that's basically an estimation, uh, is, uh, most likely it's more than that and 73% of these libraries are in developing and transition countries. And uh, these are institutions, <coughs> for the large part, publicly funded, that uh, of offer access to information and knowledge, let's say broadly, and we think they can play an extremely important role in accessing um, data. Um, when we looked uh, at the over of open government partnership and we looked at the numbers of countries that actually uh, in their plans spoke about the ecosystem, only three countries, uh, including UK, Ukraine, Tanzania, actually they have considered how citizens can access those data. And uh, only Ukraine uh, mentioned libraries as, a, as an important partner in this ecosystem. But we think that uh, Libraries are often perceived as a, as a building where you find books, and, uh, and that's true, uh, it's, still, it's still like that. But actually, there is much more potential beside that, and we think that uh, in the open data, uh, they can play an extremely important role, particularly when you look at uh, the <coughs> cost effectiveness of providing access point to the citizens, and, uh, and also when you ensure that everybody has access to these resources. Uh, another thing that uh, you mentioned before and I really liked uh, was when you discussed about accountability and you said, well, once you open up data, uh, accountability is there because transparency is there and people are empowered. I think there is a step in between, is that uh, you assume that once you put data outside, then people will go there and look. But that's not I don't think it's a direct link. There are many people that uh, have no clue about that, and uh, maybe uh, they heard about the media, but they don't have the literacy and the skills to do that. And uh, so I, it's where I think that here libraries can provide this, this, um, <coughs> this part that actually can make this link work perfectly. And uh, I have an example that uh, I think can easily illustrate that. Um, in Romania, the Ministry of Agriculture uh, produce an online application uh, to make subsidy quicker for the development uh, of the rural areas. They release the data from the rural areas, the old uh, land that wasn't used, and they, and they wanted uh, to use technology and data to involve their citizens actually applying to that. Uh, what happened is that farmers happened to donate the tools, actually, they weren't reached by these um, um, <coughs> initiatives until when around 400 public libraries, uh, that, that was a project where IREX, another organization with whom we work, stepped in. And uh, suddenly, 17,000 farmers uh, were informed about this program, were trained to apply to this program, and actually they applied to get subsidized land and make the whole project work. Uh, 
that's just a case to give you an idea. Um, I would like to sparkle and put some other things out there and then engage in some discussion. I was thinking that uh, the role of, di of libraries in data and data mining. Uh, it may be trivial, but libraries have been collecting since ever data about who comes to the library to read what and, uh, and, and to do what, basically. And usually this data is shared among libraries, but it's not always uh, perceived and used by uh, government or public institution. And when you're looking at plants where you intersect uh, access to data and education, that's an important thing that I would like to point there. Another part of the library world, and here we go more into the uh, role of open data and government and accountability is the role of parliamentary libraries. Uh, all parliaments worldwide, they have a library that stores all proceedings and documents and uh, laws and draft laws and bills for the activity of the parliament. And uh, these are um, data out there. I mean, no, I mean, they're not out there. I mean, they are in the library but uh, not easy, easily accessible. Usually you have to walk in there and, uh, and figure out how. Uh, not long ago, I was following uh, the US election, the US politics, and I was browsing on my mobile phone and I found out an app which is called Congress, where you actually can download the app on your mobile phone and uh, you can see each member of the Congress what bill he's working on, which proposal he made. You can even go there and click and call him if you want, send him an email, all these data. And I was thinking, look, libraries and parliamentary libraries, they all have this information. And, uh, and once a country thinks about this environment for open data and this approach to make them work and provide service to the citizen, they should actually look also, the role that libraries can play, I just gave you some example, for instance, with uh, the parliamentary libraries or libraries in rural areas, and make sure that librarians that usually already have a budget line in the public budget uh, get trained to do that, because they're already trained professionals, but probably they can be trained to help citizens in access those data. And, uh, and also, they are trust professional. I mean, uh, he, the other thing is that, okay, you, have, you put data out there, but then uh, you have to ensure that at the, at the back end, uh, there are people that can make profit of that, there are people that can misuse these data. And here you have points distributed in the country with a really granular distribution in some countries, particularly I'm thinking uh, here in Azerbaijan, in the former Soviet countries, there's a long tradition of libraries. You have libraries in rural areas all over. Well, then you have a trust network of, uh, of trusted point of access to this data. And I think I stop here and I hope that I throw some, uh, some issues there to discuss. Thank you. Thank you, Andrea. We, can, uh, we will have time for questions. So, but uh, I think I'd just like to now go to Leonard Huishing to also give us some other examples of what he has been working on um, before we go to Dominic and open it up uh, to, for real discussion. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, um, it's very nice for, of you to invite me, by the way. But it's even very if nice it was of you a bit to come. <laughs> timely. Um, so I've been working on. Um, let, let me let me start at uh, that. The Dutch government has has um, the last couple of years development aid. Uh, has been, been very much under pressure and uh, actually in a new government that has just been installed this week there's been, uh, been announced another cutback of 20% uh, of the budget for development aid. Um, one of the reasons for that is I think that uh, the lack of accountability, the lack of clear results that have been seen and this has led the, um, some, some re-evaluation of what, what the Dutch government would want to be out there in terms of information for the public. More accountability, more transparency. So uh, two years ago, the Green Party in the Dutch parliament uh, had a motion to release all the data um, generated on which projects are uh, work, being worked on and being funded by the Dutch government. And um, one year ago, they actually did go, went ahead and, and released that data based on that motion that we did. And um, 
I think that it is, it is a, a quite a, a limited set of data in the sense that it's very interesting to see what, what uh, which company, which organization gets what if uh, what uh, amount of money. Um, it's not particularly interesting on the, on the, on the, for the general public, I think, but it's very useful to have uh, in terms of uh, for, for experts to, to figure out where, where the, basically where the competition is and also what works and what doesn't work. Um, it also has the side effect of being uh, giving some, some uh, level of accountability for foreign, uh, about the go foreign governments involved. Finally, we get to see how much money is actually going and into these uh, other countries. Um, and whatever happens with it, that is a problem. There's no clear information in the data about the results that have been generated with it. So it's also very limited. Um, a year ago, I, I wrote an app uh, by request of, of one of the uh, development aid organizations in the Netherlands, using this information to try to get it to a more uh, general public. And I think that the general value in that is you, you can find more value by combining the data sources. And I think that's, that is the, the uh, trajectory that we've started on. And we have now included a lot of data from the World Bank to try to make give it more meaning for the people. But what we really found is the, ge the main problem in this data, this particular data is twofold, I think, and that is that it is very much internal data. And I think there's a lot of work to be done there. And I would uh, refer to, to Andrea's comment about the libraries. I think somebody needs to clean up this data because it's generally, if this is anything to go by, this sp specific data set, um, the data is a mess right now and it's completely ununderstandable for anybody outside of the government involved. Um, there's heavy use of, 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 in the labeling, there's heavy use of, of uh, jargon, of, of abbreviations that have no meaning at all and it will be, it, it will gen I think it will take years before it becomes anything usable. So that's, that's really interesting about all of this I think, that where is this data, what, is, what does it mean? And I come from a background in, in market research, uh, where we we generally see these the same types of, of questions, and of course there we are working to give the information in, in a very useful way to the to our clients. Um, but still, you know, if you are, have been in, in market research for a while, you know that you can torture data to make it say almost anything. Um, I think that this is a very huge risk in, in releasing this data. Now this data set specifically does not contain anything personal. It's not even, you can't even use it to triangulate on, on, a, on a specific person. But you can use it to triangulate on, on certain politically sensitive projects. And foreign governments will have the opportunity maybe to go in and into the data and use it to find to locate um, projects that are not uh, how do you say that agreeable to them and i think we've seen in here in azerbaijan for instance what that might mean um i'm not saying uh, well whatever <laughs> let's not go there um i'll, I'll um I'll keep it short, but I'll, I'll, I want to refer to Al's comment that um, civil society has to be open. We have now the first, in the Netherlands, the first organization, aid organization, that has also released the same type of data in the same format, open standard. Um, and that re will re really help us to get further into the data and, and try to explain not only what comes out of the Dutch government, but then where does it go from there. So we can try to really show people what is what is the aid doing on a, on a on a very low level, increasing of course the risk of politically sensitive projects. Um, we now have the data being published once every uh, quarter. I think that is not enough. We need to go beyond that and try to have as much re real time information that we can get our hands on, um, as long as we keep in mind all the risks involved that you. Uh, Xavier have have uh, have have uh, mentioned, um, and I think I do think that we have to consider the risks 
involved with releasing data that's not maybe not personal that might have been de-anonymized uh, anonymized or ha might have been uh, uh, aggregated to a higher level but that might still be used to triangulate on, on, any, per on any one person. Um, for me it's uh, I think we are on a trajectory where we can do a lot to increase the rationality of decision making and I think that is a good thing and uh, well, again, in reference to your point, Al, that is very important to, to start proactively releasing this and not wait for motions in Parliament before you go ahead and publish anything. I think uh, the proactiveness of it will be very important. And one last point, if I may, um, would be that open standards should be prevailing in, in, the t in terms of how do you release this data. Because if you don't use open standards, and, and I know uh, there has been a movement where people want it to be technologically neutral, the way that the data is re being released, which might be, be meaning that it should be um, used by any uh, closed standard as well, and which might not be what we want. Um, I think I'll leave it for there and, and wait for your questions. <coughs> Thank you, Lauren, so much for that um, very, um, for highlighting some new risks as well and for your salient pol um, points as well as your recommendations and comments on ALS. Um, now we have uh, Dominique Lazansky, uh, who I introduced earlier for people who are not in the room. Uh, she's uh, from Tax, who went here before, uh, Taxpayers Alliance, uh, Think Tank in the UK, and she also sits on Open Data User Group in the Cabinet Office in the UK. Thanks for having me in at late notice, and I really, really appreciate it. And um, I'm going to keep it brief because we have some interesting discussion I think already out of the speakers who have who have spoken about really interesting topics and it's interesting to see a number of crossovers as well in the work that I do. I'm going to talk a little bit about the UK and open data just because that's the perspective that I come from. I sit on the open data user group which is a volunteer um, group that sits within the cabinet office. Um, by appointment we had to apply through an open process and there are 14 of us and from government and civil society, which is my remit, and a variety of other, uh, you know, big businesses, small businesses, businesses collecting data, um, businesses that are startups. So it's very, it's quite interesting. But our role is particularly interesting in that we're we're advising government on what data should be open. And I was particularly interested to hear Al because we have this what I think is a rather cumbersome process of people that need to submit requests to data.gov, uh, which is where our data portal is in the UK, um, in order to you know, suggest particular data sets that they'd like to use for a variety of reasons. Now, a number of data sets have been open already. I think at last count there's about over 8,000, I think, is that right? Um, and so people are, um, and, and there are more that are coming out as well. There's a work stream within government to um, to release more data. But but we're not proactively, the government is not proactively releasing data, which is, uh, I think Kenya's well ahead of us on that on that front. But um, so we, we advise the government in terms of, of what should be open. But again, the government has, the UK government has a, a particular um, need for having data to be open hit the remit of economic growth and development. So they're really interested in, in prosperity, but they really want to make sure that they can also uh, look at the value that that society will get, that economic growth in the UK will get, um, based on uh, what may be open. And projecting this and, and determining this is, as you know, almost non-existent. It's a really hard thing to do. So we, we have this interesting um, situation where we're now looking at trading funds, which holds a lot of the core reference data that Javier mentioned earlier, including uh, an address file, um, OS data. And I hope we can uh, you know, talk a little bit more about that. But we've recently released a paper as part of the Open Data User Group suggesting that the uh, postal address file, a file that's been much requested over the last three years, be released free on open government license. 
And this has caused a lot of problems because the trading funds within the UK are rather closed um, and rather untransparent in terms of holding data. But I, I mean, I hope we can explore this a little bit further in, in the questions again. But it's been it's been a struggle. And I think the key takeaway with with looking at um, these boards and looking at advising government and working with government and opening data is it's not just about opening data, but it's about a cultural change within within government and how government you know acts and reacts and and taking on a transparency agenda. Uh, different uh, people within the cabinet office and and different places across Whitehall um, deal with deal with data differently. Some are, are champions of getting it open and available. Others are um, you know scared that it's incorrect or it might uh, cause uh, some issues you know and might be taken. Uh, wrongly in the media, as I think, again, Al had mentioned. So I just wanted to kind of highlight this is what we're going through. Um, and there's a higher strategy piece that, that Javier is working on a lot being done also within um, a data strategy board, which looks at sort of the general policy around opening data going forward and what, the, what that means and whether that's, um, you know, freedom of information requests on demand. So we have a lot of interaction with our stakeholders. And as I mentioned, and I'll probably just close with, with a couple thoughts on civil society. As I mentioned, I'm actually liaising with civil society. And I've been working with big and small charities as well as local groups who may um, deal with issues around uh, housing or you know, child abuse or anything like that. And I'm, I'm there to champion the, all those causes. And it's very hard to capture absolutely everybody in, in civil society in England and Wales for this. But um, it's, it's been interesting because while it's not civil society and social issues have not been a priority, as I mentioned in the UK government, economic growth has. I think there's been a lot of um, good things happening lately around the awareness of what benefits to society uh, open data can provide for, for charities and for better public services and for charities that can possibly take on and use volunteers to deliver some services that um, on a local level that government may not actually have the ability to do. So I'll stop there and I hope that we have a bit more interaction and thank you once again. Thank you, Dominic. Um, I will first check with the remote participation if we have received any questions online. If we can start with that um, first. Hello, everyone. My name is Kenul. I'm a remote participation moderator for this room. At this moment, there are no questions and uh, okay. attendance. If there were some changes, I will forward as you, as the panel, as soon as the floor will be open to the question. Thank you. Great. If there are any, maybe you can just raise the white... Um, Okay. Next day. Thank you. Um, now, let's have the mic, and uh, we have some questions lined up. If we if we can uh, get a, a microphone over to you, please come. Thank you. Can you hear me? Okay. Yes. If you uh, can. My name is uh, Omar Ansari. Uh, I'm uh, from Afghanistan. I'm uh, president of the National ICT Alliance of Afghanistan. And in the meantime, uh, I co-founded uh, and am board director of uh, the Open Source Alliance of Central Asia. Um, we're working on annual conferences within Central Asia. It's moving every year to a new uh, Central Asian uh, capital so that we can spread uh, the the uh, the message and uh, let everyone know about the need of uh, uh, open source software and the technologies as well as the open data and the open content and systems. Um, uh, uh, one of the challenges we are facing in Central Asia, you know, it's uh, more, m most of the countries are ex-Soviet Union uh, uh, republics. Uh, and uh, uh, some of the governments are extremely conservative and they would not open uh, uh, data in those uh, countries, right? Uh, and it's uh, uh, quite a challenge for the, uh, the uh, advocates in these regions to work with the government and, uh, and convince them uh, to uh, or, or, or to open up. Uh, um, my question is: What are the uh, good uh, case studies uh, from other countries? How you advocate at government level so they're not scared of opening the data? You know, they're they're 
uh, um, they know the need for uh, uh, and the benefits of opening data. Uh, what are these um, uh, case studies in uh, other countries? Thank you for that question on that economic and social benefits that should be explained quite explicitly. And to go back to your comment, I have spoken to a gentleman from the um, part of the world that you just mentioned that caused these difficulties, inviting them to the panel, and they were saying, open government data all in one sentence. is <laughs> It's usually either open or government or data, but uh, not together. Uh, would anyone like to respond to the question? I, don't know. I, mean, I, would, I would say that from this panel, you know, probably, I mean, Al definitely has got quite direct, uh, but I think in the long term, probably we should try to talk to you after the panel and give you like some, hand, some real help, you know, rather than give you now a list of things. But you know, I don't know if Hal wants to just give an overview or something because I mean I think that we probably cannot cover it in the workshop, you know. But um, no, I don't. I don't think I'm capable of, of answering the question at this point. But I, I hadn't made a note that I needed to speak to you after this. Um, it's actually it's a great question because it's really hard to answer. I mean, in ter in the UK, this is something that um, there's a new Open Data Institute that's just open to provide for training um, and you know startups and a, it, it's a hub not dissimilar actually from Kenya iHub I think in a lot of ways where it's really just going to focus on on open data and out of that I think we'll see some case studies come out but also there's a report that the Deloitte's writing uh, on behalf of ODI and um, the cabinet office to specifically highlight case studies like you mentioned and um, I think I, again I can talk to you after but I'd be happy to share my details with you so that I can send it to you but um, great question I think it's really hard. Just to say I mean the one thing that works everywhere is definitely try to find an ally with inside government that is the one thing that everyone you know, and then from there on you know you may vary and how do you work but definitely finding someone inside that will be the champion that's the so we have uh, Andrea and then Parminda. Um. Yeah, a really quick note. Um, before, uh, but even today, uh, the word e-government was really appealing to governments all over. It was really trendy since the late 90s, and now they're already speaking about M-government. And I think that could be an entry way. Um, I can bring you the example of Ukraine. It is a former Soviet country but they, they wanted to engage in a broad e-government services for their country. They wanted to show that they are modernizing the whole structure, and then they face the issue of data. And uh, once, uh, once you want to engage in offering services to the citizens through internet, um, then you need to engage in data and open data. And then, oh wait, it's also a good example because it's a country that used libraries to do that. So this one could be uh, um, an entry point. It's also uh, worth ending, if I um, may say, that um, the open government data should provide the basis for new startup companies to start um, looking at this data and providing applications that would generate a new business and uh, would spur the economic growth by uh, uh, getting uh, some IT activity and new companies to spring up using this data and basing their models on on the uh, data that is open and available, like we weather, like maps and everything that um, Al mentioned. I think we have another question. Thank you, uh, Desiree. Uh, I, I, I wanted to make another point, but before that I'd probably like to answer uh, the question my colleague from Afghanistan has raised. Uh, and uh, I come from India with a very strong right to information movement, one of the strongest in the world, not only in the developing world. And I think it's important uh, to know where to start from because one can be dazzled and trying to go from Afghanistan situation, which I understand, to open data systems, uh, and that that could be pretty difficult. And I think there are two entry points. One entry I mentioned is e-government e is a very attractive thing. And when you start automating government, then you have small entry points to try to get that data. And the second entry point is a right to information uh, act and preceded by the right to information act was a right to information movement in India. And how people start demanding those rights, where does those demands come from? And it's a pull method in India yet. You have to give an application and pull the information, but 
drastically change the governance system in India. And I think not to jump and you know reach some kind of a what can be esoteric uh, big data systems uh, when these steps are important uh, is a big issue. And I this now connect this to the earlier point which I wanted to make. The data ecosystem has to be seen as a political ecosystem. And we try to make a mistake of seeing it as a technical system. We are trying to reallocate power. That, that should be central. We know that what is happening here is a reallocation of power between those who hold, hold information and who, those who want information is a political transfer of power. And when power changes, we have to focus on different uh, aggregations which come up. And again, Andrea talked about the demand side. Uh, uh, I have seen it that in a too big a focus on the supply side when you provide data sets actually and we think you know how does it matter we are only doing a good thing everything is a balance a lot of emphasis on this side I have seen has gone with reduction of emphasis on the community side about who is going to pull it how are they going to pull, pull it and who are the intermediaries which enable people to access data and that's that's on the demand side and there is also a new representational middle layer which is developing the kind of things you're talking about you're holding those uh, data hubs or something, yeah, you know, which is that class, which are those people who are trying to re-represent reality to the rest of the world, also is mediated through certain interest and does distort or represent things in certain manners. So understanding the power, how it is getting mediated through a different uh, data ecosystem and placing the data ecosystem and seeing it completely as a political ecosystem and not as a technical ecosystem is, is I think, very central. And thank you. I thought uh, I took longer than I should have, and I apologize for that. Uh, thank you. We have another question at the back. Troy? Can you hear me now? Okay, sorry. Um, uh, Troy Adelaine, I'm here uh, wearing my World Bank hat. Um, just really quickly for a colleague from Afghanistan. Uh, so far, uh, Kazakhstan and Kyrgyzstan are most open to sharing um, data about uh, for disaster risk reduction. And actually, our guy leading up that effort uh, is going to be in Kabul soon, so I'll connect you guys, and you can uh, continue the conversation. Um, I have a. Uh, I think I was just uh, to follow up with uh, on the comments. With our colleague from India, um, I, I, if you if you kind of look back at uh, some of the some of the beginnings of of open data, this for example in the U.S., um, it was sort of like data up first, and then they were like, well, people need tools to help process this data, and so there were a bunch of widgets that data.gov added later, maybe you know 18 months later or something. And um, I, I continue to think that the the the, the assumption of uh, a, a lot of the, the assumptions in open data are wrong about its usefulness to society. And um, uh, we have a colleague in the World Bank uh, who started and, and created his own title, um, uh, uh, Data Evangelist, <laughs> Open Data Evangelist. He's a really nice guy from, from Pakistan. Um, and I've been trying to convince him that we need more technical means to take out the, the, the user, exp to, to fundamentally change the user experience with the interface, with the, the data which is online. Uh, so I, I've proposed to him something I call date the data, <laughs> which is essentially trying to um, cross the bridge the entire way uh, using technical means for the user, such that they don't even realize that it's, a, um, that it's an open data experience, that basically they just benefit from something very specific. Um, anyway, I, I don't mean to make a really long comment. I've really, I actually have a question. For, for the panelists, um, where where are we right now in terms of tools that process, present, and, and give you sort of um, g give specific consumers, a, a specific citizens, specific data? Like, where are we technically in terms of processing the data and f helping it find a home? Uh, j just to finish up, the date the data idea is it was it's a little bit of a joke, but it's a little bit serious. Combining. Uh, the, the, the concepts and or the software for, that match you on dating websites. Uh, if, if, if we know something about you, we know your backgrounds, maybe some of your, you, some information about you, if there were tools which then could go search the data and try to match something about your background with the data which is available um, and then try to present it to you. Um, anyway, so my question is, 
where are we with tools, uh, um, technical tools that, uh, that are available publicly for individual citizens and or the intermediaries like media, which I think, by the way, uh, we, we tend to forget that we probably need to just rely on intermediaries and not, I think, individual citizens going to a, an, an open data site, finding data that's interesting to them and having it change their lives or their perspectives. So um, anyway, sorry to go on so long. Thank you for that question on the tools. Mm -hmm. yeah. Hi. I mean, just to, um, I mean, not to provide a comprehensive answer to the tools, but I think the type of tools that you were looking at in terms of uh, personal data or private, I mean, unfortunately, those tools tend to be in the hands of uh, private companies that will provide profiling services. So if you, I mean, we were talking about that yesterday. I mean, there are quite a few companies in the U.S. particularly uh, where there are less restrictions on things like court data and uh, criminal records history that will actually troll through public records and build up your personal profile. So if I want to employ you tomorrow, I will buy your life history to see you know, whether you are suitable. Unfortunately, you don't have many tools in hands of citizens to do that for themselves, and I think it's a big gap. Also, I think that you touched on the question, I mean, you were talking about match, uh, matching websites and dice algorithms. I think something that we need to remember, I mean, that we haven't touched yet is that <clears throat> basically everything we do here is data and algorithms and there is nothing else and we are looking at open data and we also probably need to start looking at open algorithms and in order to provide an open knowledge um, system you know to for society to benefit from open data no? so i think i mean we've been exploring that you know at a very very superficial level you know but i think that is going to be the next big question you know? like who if you want to have big data benefiting society you're going to have to open up that level as well then, of course, you know, visual, I mean, there are many tools in terms of visualization, you know. They, unfortunately, they tend to be either very simple or very complicated. So you need to build your own website and APIs and things, you know, for particular with the open source one. But I think that is getting there. I mean, there are, there are more tools, but not, definitely not in the ones that you were looking at in terms of matching, you know, where you put your name and see what comes out, you know. Some people, some hackers in Germany, they've been doing some experiments with that sort of thing, you know, but it tends to be more about shock value, no? so to shock you into knowing how much actually you can find out about you. But, yeah. Andrea, you also had a comment. I have a really quick comment, and I'm thinking about this word about ecosystem and then projecting in a longer perspective. I think we are at a moment where you need to invest in the long term in what we call media information literacy. You need to have your citizen, probably at school already, put in the programs um, understand what is big data, what is uh, open access to data and how they can use them and which are their rights, which are the ways to use them. And um, I mean libraries are working on that also, the media information literacy for librarians and uh, how do you process uh, because the media <coughs> can do that but uh, <coughs> at their own interest. I mean at uh, the end they are out on the market and they do that for um, it's, it's not a free service. And then I was thinking about um, a case uh, I don't know how appropriate is that one, but I was, uh, it was interesting to look how Wikileaks, for instance, when they got the diplomatic logs, the 260,000 logs, and uh, they weren't able to just throw them out like this. They had to go to the New York Times, to the Guardian, to this other German newspaper and ask them, can you look at this and make relevant stories out of that? Because otherwise we think that if you just throw them out, it's not going to be that effective. And that's what they did, and that's how everything exploded. Then um, Assange and Wikipedia that had some um, issues uh, with uh, this newspaper, and they decided to, uh, to just release the old logs like that. Okay, they, they deleted the names. But then I was thinking, look at the difference. When the New York Times was there, uh, pushing about I mean, the stories from the logs, it wasn't everything, uh, I mean, it wasn't every headlines on every newspaper. Once the logs were open up and you can go still now and browse in, 2000, in the 260,000 logs, they're not, they're not a, a big fuzz anymore. Because data out there like this without being processed, even if potentially extremely important and interesting, they're not going to be used. I mean, I myself have been a few times to the Wikipedia, Wiki, to the Wikileaks uh, database, but then I was like, well, pff, that's boring. Just to say, the question there is, um, I mean, the theory with open data is that citizens and civil society and the private sector are going to come and provide that interpretation. 
I mean, what you are starting to find is that there is a slight market failure <laughs> in some areas, you know, where they actually the state has to come back, and as you, as our colleague there was saying, and start providing their own uh, tools, no, for interpreting. So it's not just raw data. So they have to come back and provide a widget or a visualization or a report based on the data. So there is, I mean, it's quite. Um, it's, a bit, it's still a bit tricky, no, to get. But then again, you know, there is so much data. There are so many different applications, you know, to, to see that everything is going to be developed. You know, I mean, you come up tomorrow and you say, well, why no one has developed this thing? You know, who is to blame for that? No. I I just wanted to quickly say that, uh, you know, um, in Kenya, uh, certainly I can I can speak very confidently about Kenya. Um, there's quite a huge proliferation of different apps that have decided to pick up um, uh, on the open data and, and do different things. Um, if you go on to the Kenya Open Data website, um, there's a tab called Community Apps, um, and you'll see at least the first few of them that, that were placed there, and there's still quite a number of them that have um, been developed since. Um, the I, I was trying to find um, the reason I was quiet about this for a while is because I was trying to find a particular app that I'm excited about um, that came out in January when we did the data bootcamp. Um, this app was developed by a team of um, uh, three people, one who was a journalist, one who is a developer, and one who is a civil society person. And they were interested in figuring out why it is that girls drop out of school um, at the coast in Kenya um, at, uh, you know, as soon as they reach uh, age 14 or thereabouts. Um, and everybody had, been, had, had a ready answer for it, that uh, it was because of the fact that they are poor and they need to go and look for tourists at the beach. Um, you know, and it was, it was um, almost a given. When these guys actually went into the data a little bit more, they found that there's a correlation between um, the sanitary state of uh, the schools and the, the dropout of the girls. So as soon as they started uh, getting their periods, they would drop out because of the fact that they did not have a, a good sanitary environment at the school. So they would be missing school three days, four days um, a week out of every month. Um, and then secondly, that the, just the availability of sanitary towels um, for their use is also not available. So these guys actually went and built this app that, that shot, showed the status of every toilet, every sanitary facility in every school um, within um, the coastal province. And as a result of that, um, it became the tool that is used by development um, sort of people to go and figure out where they should allocate their resources um, uh, well. And in fact, what happened with that is that uh, the, a group of NGOs that focus on the coast came together around the app um, and sort of began to um, uh, uh, coordinate their activities so that there is uh, uh, better sort of development output out of their, their programs. So this is one of the interesting stories, and I, I, I'll still keep trying to find the link for this and, and share it um, if I do find it. Um, but these are the sort of things that th then come up. The, uh, as some of them, like Med Africa, will be for public usage and for you know almost retail uh, sort of perspective. But others will be very uh, other apps that have, I have seen being developed out of open data have been very specific. Of course, you you. you you probably know about the where do my taxes go in the U.S. and there is now one that has been developed in Kenya um, about where where um, the budgetary allocations go. For example, I would be able to know um, how much I pay per day for the salary of a policeman um, based on my taxes and how they are allocated. Um, so these are interesting things that um, people do. The key thing for anybody trying to do an open data um, site is, uh, you know, to once you have published the data, try and push innovation as much as possible. Try and let the young people um, have access to that data. They are very irreverent in the way that they deal with things, um, and irreverence is a really important thing in in helping 
um, people make sense of the data. Could I have some comments? Um, you were basically asking about the the, the the maturity of the current the current state of the technical tools that are available, and I think what, what I've seen is is it is very much um, it seems to be a strange mixture of, 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 of a sort of supply and, and demand side immature pressure to, to start releasing things. The reason that we start, uh, that we requested as a Green Party to release this particular data about development aid was that it would um, that the, and the government showed some enthusiasm for releasing this particular data, but whereas they were very reticent. The Netherlands is not the most open country in the world, uh, if you can believe that, even here. Um, so, but I think that, that particularly the demand side is really immature right now and that there has been a pressure that, that you see that governments are starting to open up. There are quite a lot of champions uh, also in the Netherlands uh, popping up that say that, hey, we, we have this data, let's release it, but we don't have really a clear idea of how it's going to be benefiting the users and the users are not really asking for the data yet. I think that is going to change, and I think this is just the first generation, and, and we will, in a couple of years, this will be completely different. And particularly, I think that the, the main economic benefit, at least, will be in uh, integrating data streams, um, pr preferably real-time data streams, coming out of the government into uh, business processes in, 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 in a lot of companies that will uh, increase, uh, th that will use it to increase value in, in all sorts of ways. In terms of profiling, that's quite a sinister way of doing it. But I also think that there's a lot of beneficial and, and, and very rational ways of, of using the data to, uh, to enhance uh, shareholder value. I think it would be also, uh, following that, um, it would be good to hear um, uh, from maybe Javier, how, how did, or, or Dominic, um, how did, um, for example, in the UK, how did they manage big policy versus hands-on approach? Are there any lessons learned in, um, from that um, part? Yeah, I think that, <coughs> actually, that's a very good question. I think it's, um, again, you know, looking from, from what Al was saying, you know, don't let the perfect be the enemy of the perfectly good. You know, I think that is a, um, I think that is a very good way to go. And the, then, on the other hand, we also think that you know we need to start taking some strategic approaches as soon as you can. You know, then things like, for example, we were discussing uh, data protection frameworks, not because they should be restrictive, but also they should be a scaffolding on which you build your development, no? so that's the thing to take a very positive approach to um, this thing and also not to micro-legislate or micro-regulate, but to like try to take some big picture no? and see where you, know, where you may try to foresee basically where you may have conflict. So I think that this is a very, very big question, you know, like how do you combine? I think at the moment in the open data world, we've seen a lot of the practical hands-on approach and uh, low-hanging fruits, you know, get there what you get. And I think in UK now we are starting to see some of the, you know, we are starting to hit the walls in some of these areas. And I think that's, for example, the work that Dominic is doing on the, um, you know, can I mean, she can explain, you know, how do we, <laughs> how we stand to deal with some of these walls, you know, when you don't get the data open, basically, there's no low-hanging fruit. And I think... Oh. I think that's the problem. I think, you know, we've hit the low-hanging fruit in the UK. We've got it. We've got it nailed. It's, um, it's just releasing everything else and, and trying to, to get... There are project managers in the UK in each um, department in the Cabinet Office, say, and so forth and so on, who are responsible for releasing data. And I've seen the, the three- to five-year plan, and, and we're, we're saying no no, like two month plan to release it, not three to five years. And, and that's the kind of push that we have now. Um, but to your point, I just wanted to highlight, you know, we talk a lot in our group, it's not just releasing the data, but it's data format, it's um, skills and innovation around using data. It's a variety of other things that now need to come as in the UK, it's getting mature as well. And I think part of that in the UK is also the um, growth of startups that's happening and the um, growth of, 
innovation and you know, investment into small startups, uh, especially around um, open data. And I can think of a couple examples, transportation being the, the one that everyone always talks about in the UK. But, you know, Do Deal is a, is a startup that deals with um, basically aggregating uh, company data and um, trying to, you know, pry open a little bit more companies house as well. So I think that's sort of my experience. These are good, great examples. Um, we have um, um, probably time for just one more question before, um, and there's one coming there. Um, any other takers? Uh, I don't have a question. I just wanted to point out that uh, the Knight, Knight Foundation, the Knight, uh, this year their Knight News Challenge was for uh, data journalism. So uh, I don't know how many uh, awardees there were, maybe around six or so, um, but they would be useful to follow to see what comes out of that. Thank you for that comment, indeed. Uh, there's a mic coming um, to your left. Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. I was referring to back to the introduction you made around the, the change in the name. Last year was public sector access to information. This year, it's open data. And and I was thinking about the, this this issue of demand. Uh, don't you think that the, that still the problem is in the name? And as, as still we talk about open data, we don't see the value of, uh, you know, innovation, job creation, growth, etc. It's not reflected there. It's still, what is reflected there is government transparency and accountability, but not the, the growth opportunity. Actually, that's... Um it's not that clear cut. I mean, I'm one of the coordinators of the Open Government Partnership Civil Society Network in UK. And what happened there is that you tend to have uh, organizations that work on transparency, uh, you know, well, Transparency International, Article 19, people that work, that come from a very strong uh, framework, not on the technical aspect, but more on the government, on the transparency side. And actually their complaint is that open data is uh, not about not enough about transparency that is all about uh, innovation about uh, technical standards so the way they see it is completely the opposite you know, i mean I, I you know i'm not saying that you know you know i'm saying that there are many there are many ways to look at it i mean the, normally i deal with the opposite complaint not that the you know why do we keep talking about open data we should be talking about open governance and transparency you know and open data is seen as a very narrow point that is mainly about uh, economic development so yeah i don't know <laughs> Thank you for um, pointing out. We did start maybe five minutes um, later, so if uh, the organizer allows us, we still have um, uh, two more minutes um, to, to carry on the discussion as well. Um, are there any more questions for any of the panelists? Please go ahead. Have you seen any cases where governments are publishing uh, data that is not um, that has been changed before being published so the assumption here is that the data the data that it published is open and we can trust it so the question is can we trust the data that is published I mean I don't have any top of my head examples of data I mean we've, again referring back to a workshop yesterday about quality there are two issues in terms of quality. One is quality on the bottom bottom data. I mean, is, is this, you know, are the measurements, the figures, you know, trustworthy? That, to be honest, we haven't found many cases. I mean, what people have found is that in many, you can have uh, data that is irrelevant, at least to the point, you know, that, and then what you find in many cases is that the way that the data is structured and organized around the information, you know, for example, what does this, you know, you get a list of numbers, what is the unit, you know, is like we talking, you know, like meters, kilometers, you know, what is it? So that sort of thing, and metadata and explanation to make the data useful tend to be, tends to be a bigger complaint than the actual accuracy of the bottom. Maybe it is because no one can actually challenge, you know. But I think that in some areas where there has been uh, more challenging on the accuracy is in things, for example, like uh, land registration, cadasters, you know, in the Spanish cadaster, I know, there are tons of mistakes because someone just goes to a village and starts making maps. And when the owners of the land come, they see that everything is wrong. So you have to go back and move all the things. So, of course, you know, I mean, 
that sort of situation, I can imagine that you will have, as more and more data gets open, you will start getting, and people start examining it, you will get more and more challenges on the bottom line, but at the moment it hasn't been like the main, the main obstacle, really, yeah. Um, I, I, you know, um, my perspective is, uh, is as follows, that um, I haven't seen uh, data being changed um, by the governments that uh, I at least have dealt with. And from a motivational perspective, I don't think, uh, well, it hasn't been my experience that they would, as soon as they agree to publish it, that they would bother to change it. Um, the stage where most countries are at right now is that they're not at the stage where they are publishing any data that they would not ordinarily publish anyway. The issue around open data um, or the, uh, in relation to the data that is published has been more about um, data that is already available um, or within the public domain in, say, paper format and that sort of thing that then is being given in a lot more depth and a lot more uh, electronically. Um, so from that perspective, the motivation for changing it isn't there. However, I have seen um, where, especially at the point where you're negotiating what data sets that you want to, to take out, where the government is saying, I'll give you this entire data set except for this chapter. This particular one I'm not prepared to give you because of the fact that I consider it sensitive for whatever reason, or and maybe I don't consider it sensitive, I'm just not confident about sharing it out, whatever it is, um, so I will not share this particular, but you can have all the rest of this, that sort of thing. So by the time they do agree to publish it, um, online even, um, my view is that it tends to be fairly accurate, and a lot of the data curators tend to have a lot of pride in the accuracy of their data anyway. Yes, I mean, on a very practical level, in, in many situations, the problem is not so much that they change the data, but they don't, but that they actually don't change the data. Meaning that, you know, I mean, obviously, uh, government uh, statistics are, uh, are alive. I mean, every year, you know, they, they get present. Uh, something that, from a practical point of view, is very important is to be able to have a versioning of data and to have a very clear way of saying, well, this data set, you know, is going to be either you have regular publication dates or you have like something in the metadata or a way of tracing back, is this the latest data? Or do you are going to start developing practical applications and things like risk management and things like that? I mean, you really need to know that you're working with the latest version. And in many cases, um, that is not as well managed as it should be. That's, I think, more of a practical problem right now. And, and maybe um, if we are getting uh, closer to the end of the session, it would be probably good to, if any of uh, each of you could wrap up and say how much um, was the contribution from all different multi-stakeholder um, in civil society, governments and private sector, how much, uh, who was the leader or, um, you know, how did they work together and uh, is it always civil society pushing private sector and government or has there been initiative from government to um, develop an open government data plan? Um, maybe about the interaction of multi-stakeholder. We heard a lot about ecosystems and how it worked in Kenya and how it really pr provided a lot of results. But um, if you had a key message to send out... Um, to others who are struggling with getting first the legal framework and the Freedom of Information Act uh, laid out in their, um, in, in their places, how, how would you recommend the stakeholders will go about it? Who would like to start first? <laughs> um, with regard to uh, the participation, um, in Kenya, we have what we call a quad helix sort of uh, thing. We, we had a, a task force that uh, I had the privilege of leading, and it is a task force that in, uh, had members from the government, from the civil society, and the private sector, um, and actually, and the media. Um, and in general, um, a lot of the stuff that we have done particularly in the open data regard, has been done in that general quad helix uh, sort of formation. Um, as to the second question, um, you know, I, I don't know how to answer it. 
<laughs> because, um, do you want to ask it differently? What difficulties are you finding? <laughs> you know, well, in, in, we, yeah, we've I had. Can ask. Yeah, the, you know, the the difficulties that we've we've found um, have been difficulties. You know, the gentleman from India said that this is about power. So it is always about negotiation, um, and this the, that's where the trick has been for us. Where it is about the negotiation and the argument that you make to the different people. So you'll find that um, the argument that I would make for an MP to convince an MP to get on board is may not be the argument that I make to a technocrat, because they have different fears and they have different points of objection. So. Um, the reason that I was having difficulty with it is, is because of the fact that, to some extent, um, there's a certain level of talking points that are similar to everyone else, but how it is presented to the different people um, is, is extremely important. Now, the, uh, the biggest challenge that I have had, especially where um, civil society is pushing for open data, um, they tend to talk at government and they tend to be, uh, take an adversarial position. And, and in fact, I have seen situations where they, uh, they sit across the table from government and say, but it's so easy, you know, you should be able to do this. It's, it's, all you need to do is this and this and this, um, and therefore not deal with the particular issue that, that these guys have. Thank you. Just to follow up on that, you know, in the UK right now, I think we have some really, I would say it's actually an excellent collaboration framework, you know, without sounding too like a cheerleader for the UK government, you know. Never, you know. But we, I mean, we are right now. We have an open policy making framework uh, with the cabinet office, where we are co-developing the national action plan for the open government partnership in the UK. Where we sit every Thursday, we sit together, and actually, we are really working very, very closely with people in government. Of course, you want to avoid any kind of capture in other countries that could be seen almost as corrupt. You no, know? but you have to. If you do it properly, I mean, I think we are is working very well. Dominic is in one of the multi-stakeholder bodies. There are others. I think the problem we I would say is that we still don't have a very good integration of all these different bodies. So actually, we are. We know. I mean, actually, probably Dominic and I were, and very few people actually have the full picture of what is going on. You know what, that there is a civil society space here, another one. You know, and I think the integration is uh, something that you need. But for me, the three key things in terms of the multi-stakeholders, in terms of businesses, I think that the issue for me would be that there are some businesses that are innovative and they really understand open data and innovation, and they they are getting there. Then you have incumbent large businesses that I won't name any kind of uh, three-letter database providers. You know, but there are a few that will come in and say, yeah, open data is great, you know, we have been basically taking lots of money from government for 20 years, let's see how we make this enable us to take money from government for the next 20 years. That is one, and that is an issue. Then in terms of the government, the problem I see is that we see government as a bit monolithic, and particularly in terms of political parties, I would like to see more political parties coming up and saying, yeah, we are all in favor of open data, but this is why we are in favor of open data. This my specific political program. Unfortunately, none of the political party conferences in UK, you know, explain that. And then in terms of civil society, again, we are still a bit fragmented. You know, some people see their niche as transparency, other people see their niche as uh, environment, and we are not getting that level of, you know, seeing how we are all going to fit together. So that is my, you know, lessons there. Mm, thank you. Leonard, you spoke about open standards, and I wonder... Um, uh, we heard a really good message from uh, Leonard uh, about uh, necessity to use open standards. Is there any um, other points you'd like just to mention as a last thought? Um, yeah, well, I, I do think that um, if we are going to go anywhere, we, we're going to need to address all these issues of, 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 of compatibility and, and, and whatever. Te technically, it has to work. Obviously, but it's going to work. I'm also confident of that because it just doesn't make sense to do it any other way. I think that in the Netherlands we see that it is... Um, the government does definitely have some champions, but it's also slightly superficial in, in a sense that um, certain politicians, certain groups within government have adopted a very positive attitude towards open, opening, uh, opening up. Uh, others, I think... There is not 
really yet a, a general idea of a general vision of where to go and um, we've had uh, the Green Party has had to come up with an initiative uh, proposal in Parliament to, to uh, change the, the current um, Freedom of Information Act um, and I'm I will be doubtful if it actually will lead us anywhere we have we, we, we were one of the first countries in the world to have one but it's now completely outdated and, and, and really um, being co-opted by, by a lot of governments, local governments, particularly to, to promote secrecy instead of openness. So I think that there's, there's a huge challenge uh, that, we have to, uh, that we're facing and, and um, the pressure is definitely mostly coming from civil society to, to just keep opening up and we need to develop the demand side uh, a lot further before we can get anywhere. Thank you so much. Um, Dominique, uh, would you like to say a few words? And um. Sure. Um, I think you've said a lot of what I was thinking, but I think there's a couple of things. First of all, communication and just understanding, joined up communication and understanding what everybody's working on is really key because we do have a lot of groups, I think, in some ways. But that speaks to a bigger issue in which I think um, around this in the UK, there's a lot of focus on the process and a lot less focus, at least at the moment, on the delivery of data. And I, I hope that there's less process and a little more delivery in, in, in the near future. So I'll just leave it with that for a brief comment. Thank you. And, and uh, Andrea, just not to cut you off. Really brief. I think that uh, think about the environment, uh, think about the demand side, and not always get into the enthusiasm of offering data like that and uh, think about the media and information literacy, the importance of getting cities and people being able to process and to access this data. And don't be scared of uh, involving and, and, in a way, let cities, and once they're empowered, to come out with the use of this data. It came out to my mind a really quick example. Um, a book actually came out from a researcher at the Harvard uh, Medical School, uh, Nicole Christakis, he was able to in uh, Massachusetts called Framingham that had records of um, people, uh, different health data for 40 years and through this uh, analysis he could figure out that obesity for instance is a transmittable disease and he came out with a whole book on how people in this country became obese because they were hanging out with other big with other fat people. I mean, that's just a great example <laughs> to how you can right, afford so we're going to leave it to that. <laughs> uh, so I really like to thank all our panelists. So we had a huge set of applause and then for your patience and your questions and uh, contributing to our panel. Thank you all very much. <laughs>